Anyone travel in from far distance? No? The conference has been muted. I want to have the brave, uh, nasty commute getting in. Well, that's, that actually can be nasty, right? Did she say the conference is muted, or what did she say? I think, I think we're on. Evelyn will give us the thumbs. She said something. Usually the participants are muted, right? Pardon me? Participants are usually muted? Yes. The conference has been muted. Okay. I turned it up so we could hear what they were saying. Perfect. I'm ready to go. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ARC of Northern Virginia's presentation on empowerment through assistive technology. I'm Tia Marsili. I'm Director of Trusts here at the ARC, and we have a panel presentation today. Before we get into introducing the panel, most of you have been here before. Most of you have trusts already here, so you don't need to trust pack us either. But those of you who don't know, the bathrooms are out the door you came in and it's down on the right. And help yourselves to some breakfast. We, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the ARC because I don't know who's on the webinars. I know we have quite a few people. Up. The ARC of Northern Virginia is one of 650 chapters throughout the United States. It's a national organization that advocates for the civil rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Our chapter is in its 56th year as of March 21st. And we're one of the older chapters, but obviously not the oldest. It started in Pennsylvania by parents who wanted their children uh, along, educated alongside their disabled children's typically developing peers, and so the organization grew out of a grassroots movement into what we are today. Virginia has 25 chapters. Every chapter must follow the mission statement, the adv advocating for the civil rights of people with disabilities, and then every chapter must also provide information and referral and advocacy work. And then after that, each chapter decides what programs it's going to implement based on its membership, its footprint. So we serve Alexandria City, Arlington, Falls Church City, and Fairfax County. So we have the Special Needs Trust Program. We have DD Waiver, so Developmental Disability Waiver Case Management. We have a travel training program. We have the assistive technology apps um, that Camille will speak to. We also do transition planning for people in a variety of stages. The main focus is 15 to 26, but we also have transition guides from birth till end of life. The, and then we have outreach and um, communication. If you're in Prince William County, the Arc of Greater Prince William, for example, has group homes, employment, a transportation fleet, and early childhood care. If you, there's another chapter that is run by one volunteer. <coughs> So it varies depending on where you are. Um, you're always welcome to call any ARC, whether or not you're a, quote, member or non-member. Um, most ARCs, although we ask that you donate or become a member, there's not, it's not a requirement whenever you call. We don't uh, need to know, are you a member or not. We have a little uh, propaganda here. We have our run coming up, which is on, who's running? Are you running? Uh, the 27th. 27th of April, everybody's like, I don't know, we're all Saturday, running. 27. We're just volunteering. 29th, it's the Saturday. Here we go, April 29th, Sunday, April 29th, Going the Distance for People with Disabilities, Team Challenge, 8K Race plus 2 Mile Walk. You're welcome to join us. And this year in the fall, and I believe it's November 3rd, but don't quote me, we have our gala. So every other year we have a, a gala, which is a lot of fun, so keep that in mind. Every, almost every first Friday of the month, we um, offer a presentation and webinar. I do private consultations for individuals who want to learn more about services in general in the area. Um, because the, tr the our trust program serves all of Virginia, Maryland, and D.C., I meet with people in, in, in those areas. But out of those conversations with family members, individuals with disabilities, agencies, attorneys, I hear a lot of the same questions. And those are the topics that we use for First Friday so that we can reach many more people. And 
the program is also in Loudoun County, so I collaborate with Loudoun County now. We do a third Thursday there, and I've been going to the Arc of Greater Prince William to um, provide presentations as well as Montgomery County in Maryland, Prince George, Frederick, et cetera. So we're trying to get the word out about all of this information. Many times the information we provide in the First Fridays is of a more general nature unless it's specific to, say, Medicaid waivers in Virginia. But this information you can take with you to Virginia, Maryland, or wherever you go, um, as well as the trust information, real estate, et cetera. So our next presentation is going to be on guardianship next month, May. I don't have the flyer in front of me. Fourth? May 4th, alternatives to guardianship and supported decision making. So RSVP for that. So on our panel today, we have Camille Franco. She's the project coordinator, travel mate slash employment here at the Arc of Northern Virginia. And for those of you on the webinar, you cannot see all these lovely faces, but we also have Joel Kelly, principal with Kelly Cove, custom design and build. Megan Faragasso, custom design and build. You're the manager there. And then Greg Olivara, no, Olivar, say? Olivaria. Olivaria. Olivaria, okay, who um, owns Get a Grip. And so the, they are going to present. We have two hours, so there's going to be a lot of time for questions and answers. Those of you on the webinar, Evelyn is my assistant. Evelyn is um, managing the webinar back there. So type in your questions, and she'll raise her hand and pose the questions to the panel. They'll repeat the questions. And if any time they forget to re repeat the questions, everybody just has to say, repeat the question, so that they remember, because I'll forget. All right. Camille, you're up. You can start. Thank you. Thank you guys all so much for joining us today. We are really excited to talk to you guys about assistive technology. Um, just to get uh, a, a view of the room and see who uses assistive technology, right off the bat I see that lots of people are wearing glasses. How many of you wear glasses or use contacts or sunglasses? That's all technically assistive technology. Anyone have a smartphone? That's assistive technology. So assistive technology is really, really wide and rampant nowadays, and you don't have to spend a fortune to make your access to the world uh, increase. So this is who I am. I'm Camille Franco. I work on TravelMate EmployMate, which are two sets of lessons in, on an app um, that increase your access to both travel training and it's a job coach in your pocket. I will talk a little bit more about that later when we get to those topics. Um, I want to let you know why I'm doing this. So this is my cousin Ethan. He just graduated from Marshall High School. I love this picture because it shows how inclusion works. Um, he is amongst all his typical peers, and he is cheering for his friend who just got an award. And nobody is phased by the fact that he's standing up and uh, losing his mind cheering for his friend when, when you're not supposed to at the um, and so he has used travel mate and employment and this picture shows how technology works for people with disabilities and it really levels the playing field because he's using employment right now and you don't know because everybody or travel mate everybody else on the metro platform is also on their phone so whether he's using an app that's telling him now you're going to have to get on the, met or on the metro car, make sure that it's the orange line, no one knows if he's looking at that or if he's just checking Facebook. Um, so it really does level the playing field for people with disabilities. I'm going to go really broad overview of a assistive technology, so what it is, examples of assistive technology, and I broke it up into categories of how we live. So residential, commercial consumerism, how we buy stuff, how to get access to stuff. Um, communication, employment and education, and transportation. And then we'll go over how you can gain access to assistive technology. So um, if you realize that you have a barrier, but you don't know what technology is out there for you, uh, there are organizations that do free assessments and can help identify what the barrier is, what you're trying to accomplish, and the technologies that can help you to do that. Um, and then I'll talk briefly about the funding sources that you can have for assistive technology. So what is assistive technology? It's really any product 
that helps you gain access to the world in your daily life. And nowadays, it's something that everybody uses, from wheelchair ramps to your phone to the alarms on your phone to reminders on your, <laughs> on your calendar. I mean, this is all uh, assistive technology that you can use for executive functioning, um, vision, reminders. All of these things are, are tools that we use. Um, going over what, there's low tech and high tech. So you, I, I mentioned, um, you know, wheelchair ramps, um, wheelchairs, calculators, Velcro on your shoes is technically assistive technology if you can't tie your shoes. Um, there's lots of different options out there. Um, any sort of environmental modifications, which Kelly Cove is going to talk about more in depth, um, are also technically assistive technology. Um, and then you have high tech, which now to us is not necessarily high tech because it's everywhere we look, um, from tablets to e-readers. Um, you have more specific things for people with disabilities, so eye gaze and head trackers, um, where it allows if you don't have mobility of or use of your hands, you can still access the computer or the world just using your eye gaze. So um, there's lots of cool things out there for those purposes. And then there's lots and lots of screen reader programs. I know that there are a lot of screen reader programs that are marketed specifically to people with disabilities that can be very, very expensive, um, thousands of dollars. But then there's also extensions that you can use on Google Chrome um, or, or things that you can download for a few dollars um, that will help you gain access to your computer. So depending on how much money you can spend or what you, you're able to do, there's, there's something for you out there. There's an app for that. Um, so again, the categories, so residential communication, uh, commercial consumption, transportation, education and employment, and then healthcare. Um, I'm not going to talk about healthcare today, but there are a lot of apps and um, telehealth options that are popping up at everywhere we look. Um, if a doctor or a hospital is a Medicare uh, provider, they have to have telehealth options. Um, under current legislation, so it, you see it more and more. So residential. So we're going to talk about how to make your home a smart home. And smart homes used to be, in, in 1975, they came up with the first smart home, and they used radio wavelengths and wiring. And today, for us, it really probably wouldn't look like a smart home um, because you can easily make your smart home your, your home smart with devices that you purchase for, you know, $50, $20, um, instead of having to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to make your home intelligent. Uh, so some of the devices, there are smart TVs. There are light bulbs that you can set to timers that they turn on and turn off, that they dim, they change colors depending on certain stimulation. So for uh, people that have sensory issues, uh, this is a can be a game changer because you can make any place a sensory room um, if, you're, if you're feeling overstimulated. Um, there's thermos, thermostats that uh, you can adjust from your phone remotely. They're going to talk more about, about that as well. Um, there's smart locks so that you can tell um, that have passcodes that you can open with your phone, that you, <laughs> that, um, you can give different people logins. Um, that have alarm systems set up so you know if someone went in or out. I mean, there's a lot of different technology out there. And then security cameras as well. Um, there are, you know, so many different options, and you can link them up to your phone. A lot of cable providers uh, like Cox and Comcast offer um, uh, security features so that you, they'll install the cameras, and through that login you can see everything that's going on in a house. Um, if you have a young adult or an adult that's living independently, that you, you know, want to make sure that they're still um, safe, it's an easy feature to use. Or if you have a second home, or if there's someone that you just want to make sure that you're looking out for. I know my boss, um, she, she has a 13-year-old son with Down syndrome, and she uses the Cox uh, 
feature for security because they live on the 13th floor of a building and uh, he can go out onto the balcony and she's always scared, you know, he's just going to go over the balcony one day. Um, so anytime the door opens, she gets a notification to her phone and she can see where he is and what he's doing. Um, and it also has voice features so she can relay to him that he should probably get off the balcony and <laughs> close the door. Um, uh, pet care, kitchen appliances, monitors, vacuums, there really is any, everything's available. Um, so how to make your home a smart home with Amazon. Um, so you can set up your, an Amazon Alexa, but you can also do it with a Google Dot. Um, Apple has a new product out as well, and there's other, um, you know, not as popular uh, products that you can use that are uh, AI, or AI technology. Um, artificial intelligence that you can talk to and it can navigate the world for you. So if you have an Amazon Echo Dot, which goes right now for about $50, you can control your light switches, you can control um, your TV, your, um, your door lock, your vacuum, how you feed your pet, making your coffee. Um, you can order Uber, so you can order uh, a ride from your Amazon Alexa. You can do the same thing with an Echo Dot in Apple. Uh, I'm just going to go through one set of how to make your home a smart home, but I will send out PDFs after of a list of other <coughs> devices as well. I'm not endorsing one device. <laughs> um, so a few of the things that you just saw were the light bulbs. They go for 19 uh, or $20. They're voice controlled through your Amazon Alexa. You can set schedules and scenes um, so that if, you know, you can set mood lighting for your dinner party and it can already know to do that. So you can just tell it, I'm having a dinner party and it'll set the light to what you want it to. Um, and you can control it from anywhere. So you can turn it on remotely from your phone as well. So you don't have to be there if you say, okay, you left for dinner with your family and you said, oh no, I forgot to turn on the, the light um, at the front of my house. I'm, not going to be able to get in. Well, you can turn it on remotely if it got dark while you were away. Same thing with your with smart plugs. You can plug it into any outlet, and it'll connect to your uh, to, or to your Alexa or to your Echo Dot or whatever you, device you choose, and you can make it turn on any sort of device. So whether that be a fan, um, anything that plugs into the outlet. Uh, TV, whatever it is that you need. Um, and then there are also light switches that are, you know, the light switch itself only costs $50, but you'd also probably have to have someone install that light switch for you. Um, but it is, can be voice controlled and, again, schedules and timers. And Nest is, in the, is a common and popular one for thermostats. So you can set the temperature remotely. It will learn the temperatures that you like at certain times of day. Um, it will learn your schedule. Uh, it's really energy efficient as well, but you can see it from anywhere. You can m change the temperature from your wheelchair or from your couch um, without ever getting up. So there, there's a lot of features that are, are marketed as features of convenience to general population that for someone in our community can mean that they can live independently. Um, the uh, cameras that I talked about, this one in particular is $40 and it speaks, or, or it'll talk with Alexa, it has an app, you can listen to, it has a microphone so you can listen to the surroundings as well and you can talk to someone. So if someone's intruding in your home and you can, you can see that and you can say, hey, I can see you, like, go, leave, right? Um, there's a lot of features that are available. Um, dash buttons, I have not played around with them myself, um, but when I was thinking of Ethan and when he gets to the point where he's gonna live independently, Ethan might not be able to um, go out and purchase what he needs himself or make the connection of I'm running low and so now I have to go out and buy it. But he could press a button and every time, you know, he says I'm on my last piece of bread, he presses the button and it orders more bread for him. Um, or he presses a button 
and it orders more juice for him. So this is something that for, for an individual who's living independently that may not be able to access the community um, readily at any time, they're still able to get food and supplies directly shipped to them anytime they're running low. Also on Amazon, uh, which again I'll, I'll expand on in a little bit, um, you, can, you can automate purchases. I know a lot of people have probably already played around with that, um, but you can make it so your toothpaste, you get toothpaste delivered to you every two months because that's when you run out of toothpaste. And then you have Uber um, app that can connect to your Amazon. So you can call Uber from your Alexa. So you can say, Alexa, call me an Uber. I want to get to my grandmother's house. And then it'll call it to your location, set it up, and you never have to talk to an individual, which for some people that might be a downfall, but... Uh, I'd prefer that. <laughs> But for a lot of people, if that's not something that, that you enjoy doing or it can be a barrier um, to access to the world, you never have to communicate with someone else. You can order uh, a ride. You can get in the ride. They know where you're going, um, and it's relatively safe. So, A few other uh, products. You have coffee. I added that in there because coffee is really important to a lot of people. But they have um, smart ovens. They have smart refrigerators that will let you know when you're running low, um, when you need to purchase more things. Some of them will even purchase it for you uh, if you connect it to the Internet. Um, you have, there are lots of vacuum cleaners that you can set up from your phone. Um, so you can make sure that your loved one is living in a clean and safe environment. Um, there are mops and all sorts of other automated devices, so you can make sure that they're ready to go. And there's lots of different price points, too. Um, and then Fire Stick, there are Roku's and Apple TV's and uh, lots of different devices that will communicate with your div uh, AI technology, so with an, an Amazon Alexa or an Echo or um, Google Dot so that you can tell it, I want to watch CNN, and it'll switch the channel to CNN for you. So commercial consumption, how to get stuff. That's, the big, that's one of the big barriers to living independently is, okay, so fine, we can, we can get your house set up so that you're able to navigate your house, but then you're, you, know, you might not be able to go out to the grocery store when you need to on, you know, on the dime and go and get whatever it is that you need, right? More milk. Um, or how are you going to purchase a new light bulb? Or how, how are you going to do this independently? You can't live independently because you can't do this. Well, with the advent of technology, you can do anything. So, um, so for groceries, a big one, how to get groceries independently. If you're, if you're moving away, if, say you're retiring to Florida and your loved one is still going to live in Northern Virginia, it's okay. They don't need you to go do their groceries for them anymore. Um, with Amazon Prime, you can get an Amazon Fresh pantry and automated deliveries. So Fresh will be all your fresh groceries, all your produce, any sorts of meat um, will be delivered. And then with pantry, it can be everything from chips to cereal to paper towels. And you can automate deliveries so that something is automatically subscribed in every two months you get delivered uh, paper towels. Every three months you get delivered your coffee because you know you can figure out when you're going to run out of those products and you can automate it for them. Um, there are a lot of other services that deliver groceries. You have Peapod um, that works with, um, which is a fee for service. So they pay, or that's every time you purchase something on Peapod, you'll pay, it's, uh, there's, if you spend over 100 or if you spend under 100, there's two different serv uh, fees. Um, same thing with Instacart is another grocery service. Um, Google Express um, is, there's a subscription fee and then there's also a, uh, an annual subscription fee, uh, but it delivers everywhere from Costco, Target, and more. Any, any store that has an internet presence, Google Express will deliver from. Um, 
and then you also have Fresh Direct. This is not a comprehensive list of all the grocery services out there, but these are just a few. Um, and then you have meal prep delivery. So if you have someone that really likes to cook, I know Tia's daughter is really big into cooking. And so if, if she would like to uh, live independently one day and she wants to try new things, um, but she doesn't want to spend a lot of money buying all sorts of groceries and wasting half of it, which is what I do. <laughs> I can never buy the right amount of cilantro. Um, but um, you can use services like Blue Apron, which will, or Purple Carrot, or Hello Fresh, all of these that I've listed, and there's many, many more, that will send you the exact amounts of what you need to make that recipe, and it will detailed instructions with images and icons for those of us who are challenged in the kitchen. So, um, so they really do have step-by-step -step instructions. Um, again, more than just takeout, there are many, many meal delivery services now. You can order from any restaurant you want. Um, you name the restaurant, you can probably get food from there and they can deliver it right to, to your door. Um, I listed out a few different fee structures that they have, um, but Seamless, DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, Amazon has a service too. Postmates, I really like. We, uh, we use this for a friend of mine, um, the, the Plus Unlimited. Uh, she, when her roommate's there, her roommate will cook for her, um, but if not, she doesn't have a a lot of mobility of her hands, so that's difficult for her, but she can order food um, from her favorite restaurants for $10 a month. So yes, she does have to pay for the food, but it's automatically delivered and she can order it every single day if she needs to. Um, and so with certain things like Meals on Wheels right now, might, there might be a pause to that. This is gonna be a really big um, help for those, those individuals that have been getting the services. Um, so there are so many services that you can <laughs> you can order from online. Uh, I know that Google and Amazon have just launched this new feature where you can order services through them. So you can order a cleaning lady, um, you can order a handyman through those websites. Um, but for goods, I mean, your main web websites you can order through um, AI technology. You can tell your Echo or your Google Dot purchase this for me, and it can go ahead and do that for you as long as it's been set up for you with those purchasing powers. Um, and then there's services that will do your laundry for you that they pick it up, they fold it, they put it back in place um, so that you never have to leave your home if you don't want to <laughs> um, or if you can't. Uh, I know in this area, cleanly and rinse, um, uh, are really popular, um, and the price range is reasonably affordable. Uh, TaskRabbit is actually one that I've used a lot, so if you ever need movers, um, spring cleaning, um, you know, handyman, they, it's like in uh, Angie's List where they're rated and um, they're easily accessible, and they, and they all list their fee prices their fee schedule. Communication. Oh, I don't know how this person got in there. Hello. <laughs> um, so devices. So y nowadays you don't need to go out and purchase a Dynavox. Now those options are still available for you, but you can use your general, um, a general device that, that you have for anything else, so that you can use for calling someone on the phone, um, and that is much, much less expensive, and add apps and software to it. Um, so any sort of smartphone, you can access any of these apps. Any sort of tablet, if you need a larger screen um, to be able to access it visually, you can also use any of these apps um, that will have either communication grids or uh, talk to text or text to talk or whatever it is that you need. So that if you have a difficult time communicating with the world, this, this app or the, your technology that you already have can be created into your voice into the world. Um, 
I, I wanted to go over certain vision um, applications that you can use. So JAWS and Zoom text uh, are, are two, they're pretty expensive, um, but they are some of the best magnification screen readers for you, and there's Supernova and Easy Reader. There are also a laundry list of other extensions and apps that you can download um, from your Google, Chrome, or your uh, Amazon, or Explorer, um, and download onto your computer for minimal cost that will do a lot of those features for you. Um, a lot of devices nowadays, so Microsoft, Apple, um, are, they're, they're becoming a lot more inclusive. So if you go into a lot of the accessibility features on those devices, they include a lot of this already. Um, so before you go out and purchase a really expensive device or software, make sure you, know, you do your, your research or your homework. Um, NVDA uh, is a screen reader. It's, it works with word processor um, and a few other functions on the computer. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, it was created by two young men who went to a camp together and they both needed it and they saw that everything was way too expensive. So I really, really like the, their product. Um, but again, you always do, you do get what you pay for. Um, a, a lot of these, a screen reader, it doesn't need to be, you don't need all the trinkets. You just need it to get you the information that you need. Um, but, so I really, really like that one, but there are a lot more expensive ones with all these bells and whistles. Um, Chromevox is a built-in to your web, web browser and to Google Chrome, and it'll read anything on the Google Chrome page. Um, and then you also have Read Aloud, um, which will do essentially the same thing. Um, so there's certain speech input software. Uh, Dragon is a really, really popular one. So you talk to your computer, it does whatever you tell it to do, and it'll write it out for you. It'll write your text messages for you, um, your emails. Um, and it's one of the best, it's definitely one of the best for understanding all sorts of um, different speech impediments. And I, I, I find that it relays all sorts of accents, speech impediments very, very well. Um, but you have, again, dictation uh, for Chrome. You have Google Docs for, that has voice typing enabled in it already. You have uh, Speak It, which is something you can download. I think it's $1.99. Um, you can download it onto your computer, and so you can talk, as you talk to it, it'll write it out for you. Um, and so it's dictation, all these different dictation options. So you can go for the Dragon, which is I do say it is the best one out there, but it's also relatively expensive, or you can go for one that costs $1.99. It depends on what you need. Um, employment and education. So first I want to talk a little bit about time management apps that we all in this room probably use that are also really, really beneficial for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Um, so the alarm on your phone, you can name your alarm, you can set your alarm for different times. It's great for reminders to take your medication at certain times of the day. Um, you don't have to get that fancy when you're thinking of assistive technology. Um, and there are a lot of things that you already have on your devices that you can use creatively for the people that you're trying to serve or even for yourself. I know I set alarms throughout the day to give myself reminders of, you know, you got to eat lunch now. <laughs> Don't forget to email everyone back, you know, so just to make sure because you get lost in what you're doing sometimes or you have a million things pop up and you just need a little bit of a reminder to get back to focus. Um, Mind42 is a mind mapping. Um, it's great for productivity technique. Uh, I haven't used it, but I know other people in our office use it. Um, that if you, uh, it really, it's really good for um, individuals with ADHD um, or ADD because it allows you to take all your thoughts, like in a cloud map, and organize them um, and to get you to where you're going. Um, it's a really good feature. You have 30 for 30. Uh, which will assign uh, time to tasks for you. So it'll do some task management. Um, so say for someone, 
you know, you're working with someone or you hired someone in your office that just sometimes time gets away from them. They spend way too much time on email or they spend way too much time, you know, saying hello to everyone or, you know, writing an article. You can, it will set the time for them. So it will say, okay, you're going to spend 15 minutes on email when you come in after lunch and before you leave. And um, you can spend, you know, 10 minutes going around and saying hello to everyone. Um, and you can take 30-minute breaks, and whatever it is that you need, you, it'll set that time for you. Um, so it's, uh, it's called 30 for 30, so 30-30. 30 30. Um, but again, and it's, I mean, it's one of those apps that's useful for everyone. Um, there's EmployMate, which in a few slides I will tell you about, which is what we've worked on, which is a job coach in your pocket and it's modifiable to the individual, which also includes steps like um, assigning time. So, and then Wonderlist, which is if you live with other people in your home, <laughs> if you share a home with anyone, it's definitely an app that you should have if you have roommates or spouses or children. Um, it is a shared to-do list. So everyone can download the app on their phone or on their computer, and everyone can add tasks. So for chores, for groceries, um, it's very, very useful. We definitely use it in my household because then you're not running to call someone to say, oh, don't forget the mushrooms, you know. Um, you can just add it to the list um, or you can add it to the list remotely. So, you know, if you're away for a week and you really want to have coffee when you get back and maybe some bagels to go with it, you can add it to the list and whoever you live with can make sure that they have it ready for when you get there. Um, so, and then... Uh, Momentum, which is a software for your computer, uh, it organizes your, your uh, web browser, so it can add a to-do list when you log into your web browser. browser. Uh, Trello is another group to-do list making app software that you can access on your phone and your computer, anything with a screen, really it's device agnostic. Um, Time, Time Camp and Toggle are also similar type apps that help you time manage, project manage, um, which in the work world it's really useful, but it can also be very useful at home as well because, you know, at home you also have many, many different things that you need to do from cooking to cleaning um, to making sure that you have all the supplies you need. So it can be useful for managing um, that as well. So learning new tasks. So this is one which is why we ended up developing employment. There's a lot of educational apps out there that can be very useful. So Khan Academy is, um, if you want to learn anything from, you know, simple addition to history, there are, or to algebra, calculus, Khan Academy has a lot of free lessons and activities that you can go through um, for educational purposes. Quizlet is a flashcard um, type online-based uh, software. Uh, you have TED Talks, which again are a long list of educational talks that people give that are experts in their field. Um, but there's not a lot for, say, having a job coach in your pocket. So you have a lot of tools that you can implement for time management, um, but not necessarily, there's not a lot out there for, say, you know, working on soft skills, you know, how to shake a hand, how to negotiate your lunch. Um, there were that's why we ended up developing EmployMe. So EmployMe. So I've mentioned this a few times that it's a job coach in your pocket. It's a virtual support. It's not meant to replace uh, your job coach. It's meant to expand their support of you. Um, so what we've done is we've created general templates which include greeting, negotiating lunch, uh, appropriate work topics. Um, it's really, really easy to add in if you need certain hard skills, so how to use your office copier, um, how to log in, or uh, you know, if you're working at Target, how to log in or check in at the day in, in their software or, or at a restaurant or how to clean dishes. All those hard skills can be added in there. Uh, when, we, uh, when we first formed our uh, steering committee on what needed to be created and what were the needs of the community, it was soft, mostly soft skills for employment purposes. So we went ahead and we created templates of how to do all those steps. 
And with our app developer, Wonder, that we've partnered with, uh, <clears throat> all of it can be modified to the individual. So you can add in personalized media, so pictures of them doing it, videos of them doing it, audios of them doing it. You can have them record their own voice. You can have, um, which is really empowering because they get to see themselves being successful. For both EmployMate and TravelMate, and we saw this a lot with TravelMate, is these are a lot of individuals that may have been told, you're never gonna travel independently. Like this is just not a possibility for you. And so they come to us and wanting to be travel trained, but a little bit hesitant, because they're like, eh, I don't think it's possible for me. Um, and we use their videos of them doing it, and then they can watch that on repeat, on their phone, on their, tablet, on their computer, as many times as they would like, and then they, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you see yourself doing something, you're going to be able to do it. Um, so that's, for us, why we ended up doing what the way we've structured it, uh, is because we want people to be empowered and see that they can do it too. So instead of having to see someone else do the steps or um, seeing symbols do the steps, you get to see yourself doing it. And so it's a very powerful tool. So now I'm gonna go, any questions so far? I know I'm, I'm trying to go, <laughs> go quickly, but okay. Um, so GPS navigation tools. So I'm gonna go in the basics first. So there are, Google Maps is great. Google Maps you can use for Metro, um, for your car, um, you know, driving. I, I know I use it all the time. But you, for Metro, it'll also tell you when the next Metro um, bus is coming, what lines you need to get on, where you need to switch. Um, Waze is another uh, uh, GPS navigation, which is self-reporting. So um, individuals, all drivers, get to say, oh, there's an accident up ahead, there's this, um, there's, you know, someone, there's a dog in the road, whatever it is that, that any information that's pertinent to driving, you, they can report it and it can be shared with you. Um, Apple Maps, Scout, uh, Transit, these are all apps that are available. City Mapper is one that I really like. I always tell people about it. It's very good for navigating if you're a pedestrian. Um, it, it'll calculate for you um, even how many calories you're gonna burn, but it, it goes through all, um, so like if you're gonna take a bike route, if you're gonna call an Uber or Lyft, if you're going to take the metro, it'll break it down step by step and it'll slide through and alarms will go off when you're going to the next step. So an alarm, if, if it'll say, okay, you're gonna ride the orange line three stops till the silver line, right? And when I get to the, my stop, an alarm will go off reminding me, oh, hey, you should probably be getting off right now. So it's very, very useful. Um, nowadays, I know Lyft and Uber are the most popular ones um, that we all that we have all heard of, but there are many many other apps out there. You have Easy Taxi, um, which it, it's the competing taxi app for Uber and Lyft. Uh, Curb, Curb, Via, and Bridge are all ride sharing, so you wouldn't get the car yourself. Um, there would be other people in there, and so you would get dropped off at your stop depending according to where you are along the route. Um, and then Blah Blah Car is a new new <laughs> uh, app that's available that it's just regular average Joes that are want to carpool. So you know so if you're if you're driving down 66 in the morning in your commute to DC and you don't want to pay the hefty fees that are on there now. Um, you can <laughs> you can go HOV3 using blah blah car because it'll set other people that are going in your same direction. Um, I know Uber and Lyft are adding those types of features too. So if you can if you're drive if you want to drive your car, you can put out there that you're ending at this destination, and um, it'll set up people to come to you or you go to them and drive. You guys all end at the same destination. So. Um, it's making carpooling easier. So TravelMate. So TravelMate, our curriculum um, of virtual supports include lessons on how to use the bus, Metro, Amtrak, 
playing, carpooling, um, and much more. It also includes uh, troubleshooting because training someone how to get from point A to point B is great, but not if they can't get to point A to point C now or from point B to point C. So we want to be able to make sure that your skills are trans as transferable as possible. So we also have a lot of lessons that just teach you how to use these certain apps. So how to use Google Maps, how to use City Mapper. Um, what happens if there's safe tracking and everybody, you're booted off your metro? Um, what happens if your bus doesn't come or if you miss the bus stop? So what are those steps uh, that you can then take and who you can identify as safe people to go to? So and for example, in the metro, anyone wearing the yellow collared shirt in the metro is a station manager, um, and they are always there. So identify that person, and they can help you to get to where you're going. Um, any metro staff, any police officer um, are, are people that you can go to, as, and as well as who you can call. So um, whether that be your group home coordinator, um, your a parent or family member, uh, your social worker, whoever that is, we train you doing those things too. And also, there's a lot of lessons on de-escalation, which are useful for just life in general. But when you're using public transportation, there's a lot of people. <laughs> so if you don't like being around in crowded places, what do you do to manage doing that? So we have a lot of uh, lessons in there of what you can do, and then we also give individuals options of how to de-escalate, whether that be take temp breaths, remove yourself from the situation, um, you know, listen to music, whatever that may be. So what is right for you? How do you identify what, what assistive technology is meant for you? Um, so really it's broken down into three steps. Identify the task that you want to accomplish, identify your obstacle, and then find the technology that can help you overcome that obstacle. Um, sometimes we need help doing those three steps. If you need help, you can find technology assessments. Um, there are multiple, uh, I'll talk about service source first, um, but there are multiple assistive technology labs in our area or certain agencies that will um, have, have free assistive technology uh, screenings, which uh, will help you identify those three steps and will give you various options of what you can purchase or what's available to you and also help you identify funding options that work for you. Um, so Service Source, they, they opened an AT lab not too long ago, um, in Northern, and they do free 30-minute uh, assistive technology screenings, and they do everything from communication to computer access, memory organization, hearing, vision, uh, switches, uh, and they have demos of a lot of the products. So they have a lot of products that you can go around, you can test and see what you like, what works for you. Um, and it's, they, they do guide it based off of the person. So it's very person-centered, uh, and it follows what you, what you want. Inevitably, it's what works for you and what you want. Um, and eligibility criteria, it's anyone. Any, all individuals with or without disabilities are eligible to attend um, or, to, or to receive a, um, a free screening. Um, just to clarify, someone on the webinar said that those screenings are one hour. Oh, sorry. This, but the screenings are an hour now. So. <laughs> um, but a few other organizations that do uh, screenings in our, in our DMV area, um, Assistive Technology Network, Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind, uh, the Department of Blind and Visually Impaired or Low Vision Services, Fairfax County Public Library, and all the other public libraries in each county should also have um, assistive technology uh, screenings, it's, but it, it will depend, so it'll be probably more focused on learning um, or, you know, attaining access to, to information. Um, and then Virginia VATS, which is a Virginia Assistive Technology System, they also, not only do they have assessments, but they also um, provide loans. So they have a, a, a assistive technology loan program. If you cannot um, 
gain financial funding for or funding for the assistive technology in other ways. So that's also an option that's out there. Okay, funding options. Uh, so there's, you have your general funding uh, options. So you have school systems, which will fund educational assistive technology. A lot of times that will be an app, even an iPad. I know Ethan got, and my cousin Ethan got an iPad through school um, to help him communicate with the outside world. And it had uh, certain Toby Dynavox uh, software on there. Um, government programs, so social security agencies, veteran benefits, uh, Medicaid, state Medicaid agencies, those permissions change from state to state, so I'm not going to get into that in this presentation, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer it afterwards. Um, we'll pay for certain assistive technology. Um, for uh, private health insurance, if it's prescribed by a doctor or a therapist, uh, you can oftentimes get it provided through or maybe partially funded through private health insurance. That's also an option. Um, but again, it has to be prescribed by a doctor. So that's the, the difficult part. It can be the difficult part, depending on what it is that you need. Um, rehabilitation and job programs, whether they be government agencies or private programs, will often also cover certain assistive technology devices. Um, employers can cover assistive technology because as long as it's a reasonable accommodation, um, legally they have to provide that for you. Um, and there's a lot of information on the JAN network page on that information. Um, and then there's always private pay. You can pay out of pocket. There's a, now with the advent of technology, there's a lot that's reasonably affordable to, to most of us. Um, so there's always those options. Um, so certain organizations <laughs> that cover funding. These, this is not a comprehensive list. We're going to be sending out a, P, a PDF with a lot longer list of, of organizations that have grants or help fund this after, after the webinar. Uh, um, but this is a list of people that will, they have either grants or they have um, organizations under them that also provide grants and they have it listed on their web page of, of how you can apply and what's available to you. Um, insurance options, I know I talked about Medicare. Uh, it does provide coverage, but um, the scope of the coverage can be limited. Uh, so you definitely want to read up on what those specifications are. Um, you can also work with a, a case manager um, to make sure that you're wording it correctly because sometimes it should simply, in the word, wording when you apply to get it funded, um, that can be the misstep in why your assistive technology device wasn't funded. Um, for Medicaid, again, it, first the individual has to be eligible for Medicaid um, and then they have to request the, the AT. Um, to be funded by the program, and then they have to prove that it's medically necessary. So it is, I mean, it, it can be a tedious process, um, but it is possible. Um, and then for Medicaid, they have early and periodic screenings of, for diagnosis. They, there's waivers, Medicaid waivers that we're all familiar, I assume we're all familiar with. Um, and I linked to understanding your Medicaid waiver web page in there because it can go through and really um, explain that out for you. And then again, private insurance. I want to remind you that private insurance, you have to get a essentially it prescribed from a doctor. Um, so that can be, you know, your primary care doctor or your psychiatrist or, you know, whoever it is. Um, and then federal and state programs. Um, you know, Department of uh, Rehabilitation Services, um, state assistive technology projects. So most states nowadays have um, an assistive technology initiative so people can live more independently. Um, the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research have a lot of different programs and grants. Um, 
some of those programs, you are going to have to give certain permissions to your personal information because they're doing studies, but you get, a de you get the device that you need in return for helping them do research. Um, and the Department of Education, you know, I, will, I won't read it all out for you, but these are, a lot of the, these are a lot of the funding options that are out there. Yes? Employment? Or, or okay. Am I going to talk about employment? Oh, okay. Yeah, I can talk about. That. Um, so employment. I'll I'll go back to that that slide. What was the question? The question was. Thank you. The question was. Am I going to talk a little bit more about employment? So the. Like, how would someone get that? Okay. So, employment and travel mate, so are, are funded under a grant um, to create for the creation. And so, our model has been a train the train train the trainer model. So, we have trained different organizations in the communities on how to use our suite of lessons and app, um, and you can gain access through those agencies. Um, George Mason Life, most. Spark. Um, there's a new organization that we've worked with called Empower Me, um, which is an a la carte service organization or provides services. So if you only need um, if you only need travel training, or if you only need job coaching, or um, someone to help you set up your home independently, um, they can provide those services. Um, I I have a flyer that I can hand out later and we can also email out of their fee structure, but it's very reasonable compared to what a lot of the other services are. Um, so, and I'm happy to expand on anything, but it's a lot of information to, to cover. And so if you want to find out more, please feel free to reach out to me or talk to me. Um, I tried to cover a little bit about everything in this presentation, but there is so much more out there, um, and it is readily available. So I, that being said, any questions? <laughs> um, I'm going to turn it over to, to the cool. great guys over at Kelly Cove. That was for you. And there's sugar here, too. Thank you, Camille. All right. Thank you. How's everyone doing so far? Good? Yeah. Anyone need a break? Come again. Yeah? Okay. All right. So, uh, thanks for having us in today. As Camille mentioned, I'm Joel Kelly, Megan Farragasso, my buddy Greg Oliveira, and I'm going to get into the relationship I'll actually go through that rather quickly because I think what most of you want to talk about or hear about are the services. Not so much about the company, but I think it's important for you to give, to give you just a little bit of background um, around Kelly Cove. So I'll start with just a little bit of that. Perfect. Okay. All right. So we were founded in 2005 primarily as a, well, not primarily, exclusively as a as a home builder uh, remodeler. Um, I try to, to build in some facts that I think are relevant to you, and, and some of it may, may not be at first, but stay with the process. At somewhere along the, the presentation, I think some things will kind of come into play, and I'll explain why. I'm giving you information like our valuation, right? Our business valuation, we were recently uh, valued at about $22 million. Uh, and again, Stay with the process. I'll tell you why I think that's relevant as we move down the line here. Uh, we're uh, licensed re for, as a residential and a commercial contractor in Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. Uh, we have um, residential caps uh, and universal de uh, design architects on staff. Does anyone know what caps means? No? All right. So caps is a certification. It's, it stands for Certified uh, Aging in Place Specialist. So doesn't mean we're able to conduct brain surgery, but what it does, it, what it does mean is that we're actually able to go out and 
um, provide, well, one, consult with the community at large, and then able to provide meaningful and thoughtful uh, solutions around what your needs, your adaptive needs might be, right? So there's, there's a curriculum that folks like us go through at a very, very uh, high level. It really talks about the industry. It talks about the needs of, of clients, and it talks about um, how to best design uh, solutions around the community at large. So it just means that we, we just, just wake up one day and decide this is what we want to do without any, any purpose and thought put into it, right? So again, so we have residential uh, CAPS uh, folks on staff. We have a universal design architect on staff. And, and for those of you who may not know what, uh, what it is to, uh, what universal design is, it's really the practice of designing spaces uh, that are built for you to live more conducively as you age, right? And by the way, it's not just for those who age, it's for those with special needs as well, traumatic, uh, traumatic needs. So universal design is more of a, uh, a, new, a new way to design spaces to be more livable and, and stay in those spaces as, as time goes on. Um, we're a contract holder on Virginia Triple CP, uh, which is the Commonwealth Coordinated Care Plan. Uh, it's a Medicaid program in Virginia. We're also on a very similar program in Maryland called the Community First Choice Program. So it is also a Medicaid program. Um, and then I'll get into one of the other vehicles that we by association are also on as well. And Greg will probably talk to that. Uh, so who are, oh, I think I went through that already, right? These darn Max. Um, our first aging in place job was in 2009. It was purely by accident. Um, again, I'll, I'm going to breeze through this because I don't think it's totally necessary, but I'll give you just a little bit of context as to why a home builder is sitting before you talking about it, uh, uh, home modifications, right? Um, we were asked to do a grab bar installation in 2009. Uh, we did it, went well. We had another opportunity to do. To do uh, another very, very small uh, engagement or adaptation. We did it, went well. And then we joined the National Aging in Place Council. And from there, we were exposed to a whole new network of um, folks. Just recently, we got a call from a private payer um, who didn't know where to go to have mo modifications for his 90-year-old mother and father, right? He had, he had nowhere to go. He called the National Aging in Place Council. We're one of the few members in the Northern Virginia area. They called us, and, and we're about to submit a quote to, to do some work uh, there for them. So we're a member of the National Aging in Place Council. I mentioned we're on those two contracts. I mentioned we have, actually, I'll give you a, bit, a little bit more specifics. We have four certified aging in place specialists, one clinician, and one universal design uh, architect. And then we have a joint venture with my, my good friend Greg Oliveira over here with uh, Get a Grip. And I'll get a little bit more that way, right? Okay. Talk a little bit more. Actually, I'll leave this to you, Greg. Sure. <laughs> okay. So my name is Greg Oliveira. Um, I started Get a Grip 17 years ago in Maryland. Before that, I worked for a DME company delivering wheelchairs and walkers and hospital beds. Started that when I was 17. Realized there was a lot more to a home than putting a wheelchair in in a hospital bed. So, like Joe, I started putting bars in, setting up people in their homes, and realized that there are actually two different ways of doing it. One would be universal design, where you remodel the entire bathroom, put rolling showers, make it large, accessible by wheelchair, by walker, or just walking into it, making it look like it was built that way, so it looks beautiful. And it is one way to do it, certainly is more costly, um, so I ought to offer that up, and then I offered up an adaptation. So rather than tearing out a tub and putting in a shower stall, I would cut the side of the tub out, and I would put a transfer bench in so they could sit and slide in and not lift their legs over the side or just step in. That process is much less expensive. It's a five-hour process, and I can set a whole bathroom up for somebody, and that's adapting. So you can actually redesign and remodel, or you can adapt. And so when we go in... We'll look at a person's mobility, so how long they're planning on staying there, what their age is, and then I would give them, we would give them different options. If you were 30 years old with MS and plan to live to your 70, you might want to tear out your bathroom and put a rolling shower. If you're 90 years old, you might want to cut the side of your tub 
and just slide in and out, okay? The reason for that, obviously, many different reasons. When you're 90, you don't want someone tearing apart your bathroom. You just want to be able to take a shower or a tub. Obviously, because the side of the tub is a shower now. Um, but there are so many different products used these days to adapt to home when somebody wants to take a tub or can't get in and out of a tub, can't get off of their toilet. Um, rather than putting a bedside commode, which everyone here has probably seen before, over the top of a toilet. You know, we'll adapt the toilet by putting hinge spacers on it, putting a taller toilet in. Um, we have a lot of different type of bars that don't even really look like grab bars that we can put in, like toilet paper holders that are bars and toilet paper holders. I find that when you're younger, it's easier to do, deal with putting the stuff in, but when people get to be at a certain age, they just don't want to look like something's, you know, there, like it's there for them to use only. And so I try to put products in that everybody could use. It doesn't look as obvious if I can. But let's face it, you get to a certain age, and these products are just necessary, or you can't stay in your home. So aging somebody in their home, which people prefer to stay there, you know, there's two different ways of doing it. We look mostly at entrances, stairs, and bathrooms. They're the most difficult places in a home for some a senior. Um, if you're very young, we might think about setting up one floor of a house. So there is no stairs if you have a disability, let's say, like you're wheelchair bound, you have MS and it's going to progress. You know, I would say we put a full bathroom on the first floor because one day you won't be able to get up the stairs in a and a, a stair lift is hard to transfer on by yourself. So to age someone in place with little, you know, more independence and less health makes somebody feel much better about themselves as you get older. You don't like to ask people to help you to do things. I mean, I don't. Most people don't. So from taking a tub out, making a shower, or cutting the side out, um, raising a toilet up, usually with my customers, they always pick the cheaper route because it's, first of all, it's a lot less expensive. Insurance doesn't cover most of this stuff you're going to do to a bathroom anyways. You have to come out of pocket for it. Or, like they say, find the funding someplace for your specific needs. Um, but if you can't, then for a few thousand dollars, I can make it so you can get in and out of your tub and shower and get off of your toilet, you know, and get out of your bed. You know, it's not that difficult. So the universal design is great when you're building a home because you can design it, build it, and not have a huge mess. And everything is integrated. The, the, the cabinets are set lower so you can get to them from a chair. The uh, countertops are lowered so you're accessible by a wheelchair, but they don't look like it. They look like the house was built that way. Um, and so I do love that style if you can afford it and you're young enough to use it. Otherwise, I think adapting a home and going in and evaluating somebody and saying, you know, you need to have a taller toilet because you're falling down on it. Um, you can't get out of your bed because it's too low. And I'll walk through and make them sit on a bed. We'll have them get in and out of a tub, sit on their toilet, evaluate where they're reaching for, what they're grabbing for. Most people grab for towel racks that will support 15 pounds, not 200. So I'll take the towel racks out. We'll put a grab bar in its place and tell them, hang your towels on. And then you can pull yourself up still. And that's a way of compromise. A lot of it... Is function and, you know, you have to make it so that they're willing to put it in. So, and when you're younger, these younger people with disabilities that are cognitive, the technical part that you're talking about is critical. It's very important for somebody who has a cognitive or, or dementia. You want to monitor them. You want to make sure they're okay. It becomes very difficult to do 24 hours a day, where the technology part that she's talking about is fantastic. You can monitor them. You can make sure who's coming in and out the front doors. Um, and it is very inexpensive. Rather than saying, well, we can't take care of them, let's put them someplace where it's $10,000 a month. Have them at home and just restrict where he's going or her, whomever, by monitoring them. Don't try to trap them into a bed by putting rails on it because they'll climb over the sides and hurt themselves. Make sure when they get up, you know they're getting up you know, and where they're going. Um, and that technology part is just coming into play big time recently. So, and I'm a big fan of it. Um, it really helps people that have disabilities, you know, cognitively. But mobility-wise, most people, it's their staircases. We'll put stair lifts in for them on their staircases. They're fairly inexpensive. 
Uh, they're tax deductible in most states as a medical expense if you meet the criteria by the IRS, which is 10 per I think it was 7 I think they raised it to 10 to adjust the gross income, and you can deduct the medical products each year. And so I would tell somebody if they're going to pay out of pocket, plan ahead and try to get it done in one year to meet that and get the deduction. You get a stair lift one year, you cut the tub or remove the tub and put a shower in because you can't walk in your wheelchair in another year, it might not be deductible. So as much as I can do it once, I try to do it for them. And I try to make people think, look ahead. Yeah, you need to look ahead at your future because none of us get any younger. And our, our, our abilities, our mobility decreases significantly starting with your eyes. And then it's your legs, you know, that go. And you hope that's what goes first, not, you know, so. Um, because it, it's difficult for people. I see 600 people a year and, and try to figure out how to get them in and out of their house, up and down their stairs. And usually we start with the per hand railing on the stairs. And we go with that for a while. We, and we have them call back. I don't try to overwhelm somebody either. None of us would want to do that. But going in and telling them honestly what is important for them to have to keep them in the home and not fall. Uh, for a senior, and, and then for somebody younger, it would be like accessing widening doorways, power wheelchairs, you know, functioning in the kitchen, because when you're 90, you're probably going to have help. When you're 40, you're going to want to do it on your own, and that's when you have to redesign a kitchen. So I believe in redesigning something for someone very young, and for somebody who's up in their, in their years, adapt. Don't try to rip the whole house apart. So, um, and if you're going to redesign, have not a regular architect. It has to be somebody who deals with disabilities um, because sometimes they don't take a lot of things into account. Are you going to be in a scooter, a power chair? You know, do you come out the garage, the front door? I usually put aluminum ramps in because they never break, they never rot, and they're removable and there's no permits necessary. Uh, elevators, porch lifts, all run on power, all can break, whereas uh, a ramp will not. Now, if you put a wood ramp in, it will need more, you know, cleaning, uh, sealing, aluminum. Never, never have a problem with it. So that it's very ugly, but it's very functional. So, and I mean, it really depends. Some people don't want to see a ramp in the front of their house, so they want me to build a deck and design a wooden ramp into it, which I can understand. It's just a significantly more money than just putting <laughs> an aluminum ramp. And so when you're young, something pretty is going to look better because you're going to be there for a long time. But if you're 90 years old and you just want to stay in your home, then I just say, let's just put a ramp in, aluminum ramp for now. When you pass, I'll come and buy it back from your kids. Take it away. So um, you'll get a lot more out of adaptation for seniors. And if it's younger people, it would probably be more redesigned. But it's much more expensive to do that. A bathroom to remodel for me is about 15000 to put a roll-in shower. I can put bars and cut out the side of a tub, put a transfer bench in, and raise a toilet for 2000 and make it completely functional. As long as you're on a walker, uh, and even in a wheelchair, a lot of times with we'll adapt. I'll put a little ramp, I'll raise the shower floor, and you'll roll them right up inside. When they're no longer using it, I take the composite floor out, and I take the ramp off, and it's a regular shower again. So, and I've, over the years, had to figure this stuff out. There's no class to teach you. You go into a house and somebody doesn't have the money and they need to take a shower, and you have to figure out how to do it. You know, if they have $1,000, you're not going to put a rolling shower in. You know? But for $300 for a ramp and $400 for a composite floor, I just raise the floor up in the shower, and I put a ramp, and you roll right in. So there's always a way of doing something. It's just a matter of looking at it and figuring out what it is. Insurance companies, if they're only going to give you $5,000 and they need to stair lift, they need to get in a shower, well, we'll modify it with a lift, and I'll lift the floor up and put a ramp in. And that way, they get everything they need for 5000 rather than sitting there trying to wait and get things approved, you know, when they become larger funds. When you've got $10,000, $15,000, it's a lot harder to get the money for. And especially when they need it within the first in a month or two months or three months, you can't wait two years to take a shower. That's so long. I've had people in their homes upstairs for two years put a lift in, and they're crying when they come downstairs and see they're downstairs again. I had a guy that was in a hot condo, uh, southwest in an apartment. He was there for two, oh, two and a half years. He couldn't get out. They had to bring everything in for him. And 
The landlord fought and fought us about putting a ramp until the city finally was going to sue him. We put the ramp in, the next day he was outside rolling around in his power chair, and he was just in tears. And it's just something so simple as a small little ramp, you know, that, that does it. Um, but seeing these people being trapped and then finding the simplest ways to get them out of a house um, is wonderful. I love doing it. You know, it's a passion I started a long time ago. And it's the only way that I know that I can make money and take it from somebody and they hug me when I take it. They're not saying, oh, damn it, I didn't give you this money, and, you know. Do you do an assessment of the house? Uh, yeah, we do do assessments of the house. The gentleman just asked, do we assess houses? Yes. We go in and evaluate the house, watch, look at their mobility. We'll talk to the social worker and occupational therapist if they're available or have notes. But I've done it such a long time that I can literally go in and look at the walls, look at the stairs, and I see what they're doing automatically, instantly. Um, and a lot of it is suggestions. They're walking around with their hands on all the walls. They need a rollator or a walker. You know, um, and you can tell the walls are dirty. Their hands are everywhere, up and down the stairs. Uh, if they can still walk with a walker, then I put a railing on the stairs and clean their wall, come paint it. They don't have to put their hand on it anymore. And then when they can't get but halfway up the stairs, I come back and put a stair lift in, and we keep them in the home. But we do it in steps. It doesn't have to be all done at once if they can't afford it. If there is a fund that's going to pay for it, take advantage of it, put it all in at once and take advantage of that fund. If not, just encourage them to do it in steps. Once they get the handrail and see how well it works, once they get a taller toilet and see they can get off it, they'll listen, they want more product, and then you can put things in to just adapt it. Do a lot more work, okay? Especially when you're in limited funds. Just have us come in. I'll tell you exactly what we can do. To, and if it doesn't work, I'll give you your money back. And I'll put it back the way it was. We give a one-year warranty on everything we install, and then whatever warranty comes with the manufacturer products. So most people, for the first year, never have to worry about anything if something doesn't go wrong in that time. And if it doesn't work and we put it in, I'll take it out and put something else in that will work. Another question? Uh, another question from the webinar. Can you talk a little bit more about the assessment and the cost? Of the yes. Um, so somebody on the webinar asked more about the assessments and costs. Uh, generally what we would do is we would come in with um, a, a cost to do the assessment, and generally that was $200 or it was $165, I think it went to $200, but that assessment cost is built into the work we do. You want a stair lift and I come out and measure it and there's a cost to it, and then the stair lift costs $3,000 and it's a $200 evaluation, well I would take $200 off of the stair lift. So it would now be 2800 instead of 3000 okay? So if they do the work with us, then we certainly deduct the evaluation fee from the work. But to come in and do an evaluation and talk to somebody and not charge them, and then, then you know, we have to get something for the evaluation fee. And uh, then they can either go out and put the stuff in themselves or just call us and I bring it all with me in a van with two technicians, and we put it in, we have them walk through, we have them try everything, and if it doesn't work, they call me and I say, put this in, try this. So we have to have the person there when we put everything in. Also, anytime people ask us to go evaluate a home, but the person's in a nursing home or in rehab, it's very difficult for me to do that. Very difficult, because I don't know their mobility. And without knowing it, it's hard for me to tell them what they need. So if there's any way they can be home for an evaluation, it, it's really important to do. Um, it's hard to evaluate somebody in a nursing home or a re rehabilitation center. The only thing I can ask them is, are they on a walker or a wheelchair? You know, do they have COPD? Uh, is there an, you know, but if they're there, I can see how far they can get up the steps, what they're holding, what they're doing. And so I try to explain to everybody, please have the person there to do the evaluation. If they're not, it's very difficult to do. And when we do an evaluation, we can have the install done within a week. Pretty much everything we eval gets done within one week, unless it's a curved stair lift. They take three weeks to a month to get. You know, but a straight stair lift, you could call us and I can have it measured and put it in the following day. Um, and then our services on things like stair lifts, which are very important for people, uh, if it breaks, we come out the following day. 
you get bumped to the top of the list. So we find it very important that the products we put in work for our customers and we stand by them. Somebody stair lift breaks and we say, sorry, we're not coming out today or tomorrow. Well, how am I going to go to bed? Can't get up the stairs. So they become a priority, and we have a technician go out and, and fix that product. So what's your contact information? Contact information in Virginia, you would be contacting Kelly Cove. It, it's, it should be on there, sir. It's, it's on the. Uh, you'll have it on here, and you have um, one of the cards as well. They also have cards outside for both of their contact information yeah. as well. But uh, you would call Kelly. He would give us the information. I would go out and do an evaluation, and then Kelly would give you the um, scope of work, the cost, and if you say yes, we would come in and put it all in and pay us when we get the install done. I generally don't ask for any deposits unless it's for a curved stair lift. Um, unfortunately, if you were to order one and I got it built and then you canceled, I would. In the the curved stair lifts are very expensive; they're like ten to fifteen thousand. And once they make the track, I have to pay for it. So uh, there is a deposit on that. Unfortunately, I have had people order them and then somebody pass, and then ended up stuck with a six thousand dollar track that I had to throw away. So. When it came to curves, there's a deposit. Straights, there's no deposit. If we were to do a very large bathroom before you, it's done just like any contract or in draws. We write up a contract. You get three draws. We get one when we start. And after we've got it all torn out and, and, and put back together for the most part, we get a second. And when it's finished and you walk in to use it, we get a third draw on that. Um, and sometimes it can be considered a tax deduction if you have to put something in for medical, like a rolling shower, because you have MS, you're wheelchair bound. Okay, that is a medical necessity for you. So you can build, put it in and then get a doctor's script for it, give it to your accountant. There's amazing things what they can do, accountants. So, and there's the, you can get deductions for it. Anything that's medical, grab bars, stair lifts, commodes, um, you know, power wheelchairs, ramps, they're all deductible, okay? if you meet your adjusted gross income. So uh, a lot of my seniors, unfortunately, are on a fixed income, so it doesn't really work too well for them. So that's why the, the less expensive route works best for, for a lot of the people that I deal with, which are basically I did aging in place, which focused solely on seniors wanting to stay in their home rather than go to a rider wood or a facility where, you know, there's you're taken care of, so which can be fairly expensive. Um, so it's actually cheaper to stay at home, adapt, and then hire someone to come into your home than it is to stay in one of these places where you have to buy in, pay for your meals. You know, it, it can be $10,000, $5,000, $10, $10,000 a month for some places. So, so it can be cheaper to stay at home. And basically, that is what our main goal is then, is to help anybody with a disability try to do it as, as cost efficient and and also as functional as we can make it for them. So, um, and we started uh, our, our about two years two now. years now. We've been working together, but you know we've got a lot of experience between construction and adaptation. You can pretty much get anything you need done. I do concrete. I do iron railing. I do electrical for lighting. I do um, remodeling bathrooms. Pretty much anything that they would want. The only thing I don't do are elevators. Electronic thermos. Because they're unionized. Yeah. And I don't Light switch want to not. deal with the union on an elevator. Mm -hmm. So most homes can't afford an elevator. You have to have a million dollar house to make it functional. And, and within, you know, you put a $70,000, $80,000 elevator in a house that costs $300,000, you're wasting your money. You'll never get it back. And you put it into a million dollar home, and it's kind of expected. So, you, you know, if somebody's got that, I say, let's do a stair lift up the stairs rather than an elevator, unless they're completely non-transferable. They can't transfer them. You know, then you would have to have some type of a porch lift or an elevator. And they do actually make indoor uh, lifts that aren't elevators now. So, um, other than uh, then, I guess that would be all we really I have to say. Uh, Unless you have any questions, anybody have any questions? Greg, can I add something? Absolutely. So just to so that everyone is clear, the so what you have before you today, is joint venture. yeah, right. Um, you know, with Kelly Cove, we have the 15 years in the business. I mentioned earlier about the 
um, our valuation. And the reason why I feel that's relevant is that the, the business, and, and if you're in this business, you know that it's a tough business uh, to sustain yourself in, right? Um, if, you're, if you're doing environmental modifications, particularly if, you're, if your clients are government funded, right? Uh, it's tough for a small business to actually uh, sustain yourself when you're driving all over the DMV area, um, expending your resources, and you may not see business come in for three months. You may quote on something today, and it may not come in for three or four months, right? Um, so, the re so that's the reason why I talked about our valuation, because we actually have the resources. We have the financial resources, but we certainly have the people and expertise resources with Kelly Cove combined with Get a Grip. Um, that's the nature of the joint venture, right? So, the two, so that everyone's clear, two companies here, but we're all focused on one mission. Um, within Maryland, we have contracts. Within Virginia, we have contracts. Uh, Greg has uh, some contracts, some, some non-state contracts in Maryland, has a very large contract in D.C. So combined with Kelly Cove and with Get a Grip, we're doing more environmental modifications probably than anyone in the country, actually. Yeah, now I am, yeah. We probably are, yeah, in the country. Yeah, between yeah. the two of us, we are. Yeah. So that, that's why I, w I wanted to make sure you understand what, what the, the joint venture is, why it was formed, um, and the reason that some folks say it's kind of, you know, why, why would you tell folks about, you know, your valuation? I think it's important that people know that we're not here today, gone tomorrow. We're actually, we've been around, I guess you've been around for 18 years, your business, right? And we've, we've been incorporated and doing business for 15. So that's the reason why I, want, I thought that was um, important for you to know. Another thing I wanted to note, too, um, there's, and I know you can't cover everything um, in, in the way of technology, but we've had, um, in fact, one of our, one of our jobs that we, that we actually were exposed to through a uh, National Association of Aging in Place um, was a job out in Crofton where we installed sensors that are basically, think of them like plugs. You plug them into an outlet and they emit rays, right? And you can, you can, go, on, you can go on your computer or on your phone and set critical zone areas so if your grandmother or someone typically falls around a particular area, you can cut, and you can do it, anyone can do it, right? So you can go on your PC or on your phone and say, in this, in this box area, right, in this room, let's just say this is the room, right? So pretend this is the room, right? And this, this area of the room is where there, is, there are two stairs. And this is where grandma usually falls, right? So you can actually program the, the rays to triangulate in that area and alert you if there's movement in that area that doesn't move from the area, right? So in other words, someone's walking in, into that area, and typically if you're walking down those stairs, you're on your way somewhere, right? But if you're walking down those stairs and you wind up staying there, it'll send an alert to your phone, it'll call you, uh, it'll send you an email, a text. And the reason why that's, that's, that's a, a useful technology is that some folks don't want video cameras on them. Some folks don't want to be watched from, they don't want their son watching them from London, right? Um, but the son wants to be able to have the same, uh, or the, the caregiver, or the, what, whomever the family member is, they want to be able to have the security of knowing, you know, how mom or dad or whomever is doing. Another technology that we sold as well, and Greg, I'm sure you've sold it as well, um, there's medical dis uh, medicine dispensers. It's all IOT, it's all connected to the lab. So it alerts folks, it'll tell you if you're a thousand miles away if someone's taking their medicine. Another technology, and this will be the last one, but these are ones that we're getting a lot of, re we've gotten a lot of requests for. Um, I guess the technical term is thermal heat sensors, and you can set, and they're really simple to install, they're not expensive. You can install them in kitchens, so if you're worried, if you're if someone is independent and he or she likes to be able to cook on their own, let's say they have a, a gas range, it'll tell you how long the heat is actually being emitted in the kitchen. If it's on for, you know, four, you can set it, right? If it's on for more than two hours, you can set it to send you an alert. Maybe someone forgot to turn the stove off, et cetera. So things like that. There's so much. We could probably spend a full day just on the technology that's out there. But I bring that up because it's affordable. It's not, you know, it's not cost prohibitive. So... So that's really it uh, for me. I wanted to uh, thank you all for have, having us in. 
Greg, you bring just enormous value to this. We, I could, we couldn't have done this without you. You, you actually um, provide so much color and context to, to what we do. It's not really a boring business. If I can just share one other story, and this is to your point about, you know, folks who, um, when you when you install lifts, and then you one of the one of the, the uh, members were you know, shed tears just from being able to be outside the home. It's starting to affect us as well when we go out and we get and I get in front of clients. Just recently, we did uh, a quote for a mom and her daughter who has cerebral palsy, and they were taking shout. And then the husband died not too long ago, and the husband um, mother's on her own, and she has to effectively wheel her um, her daughter into a very very small sh a shower and actually get in the shower with her daughter without a handheld space that's maybe this big in a wheelchair and shower together with her daughter. Hmm. Uh, left there broken up, right? I mean, this is, so you've been doing this for 18 years. It's, I've been doing it in, uh, not quite that long, but uh, I'm relatively new to the game, but in terms of having face-to-face -face experience with these types of cases. And, you know, Greg, they, they came forward with a solution that came under the, the cost limit and now the mother is just over the moon happy, as is the, the case manager, and, and so are we, right? So it's, it's rewarding to be able to walk into to clients and, and provide them with creative solutions um, that other folks aren't thinking about, right? Other folks, if, if to the extent that we have competitors, there's probably a few companies in, in the area that have somewhat of a focus on, on this industry but no one has a creative and conscientious approach um, and the combined resources that, uh, that we do. So just wanted to leave you with that, and thank you again for having us in. Do you have a question? Yeah, I just want to know, sure. could you give us more information about the alerts that you were talking about to show that someone's taken their medicine? What is that? Well, so one of them is uh, by Philips. The one that we've sold is by, yes, it's by Philips and it's web-based. If you want, I can send you the information. Do you have a way to contact mm -hmm. everyone in here? And I will add it. So after this, you guys all signed up. Um, and if you guys leave your emails, we're going to be sending out PDFs of a lot more information that we didn't, we are not capable of covering in two hours. Um, and so we can add that okay. to the list. Okay. I'll get it to you. I'm sorry, what was the question? I'm sorry, I forgot to, to so the question was, uh, the, what's the, who is the provider uh, that makes the, the, med the medicine dispensers that you can monitor over the internet? And the, the answer is uh, Philips. That's, that's at least one of them. I'm sure there's more than, than Philips, but that's the one we've sold. And for every product we mentioned today, there's probably like four or five at right. least different products right. made by another <laughs> company. I mean, there's a lot of... Every day. Yeah. It's like they make, uh, you know, the first alert, you push the button and, and someone answers the phone, and then they have to call the emergency response. They actually make a phone, you or a, it's like a phone you plug into your landline, and it will do it for you. And then when, it, and it's when 911, you can talk to them on the, and if you don't respond, they come to your house anyways. So, and it's $300 rather than paying $30 a month. So, and it's movable. You can take it from one home to another. I have a guy who lives in Florida and he's up here, so he just packs it and takes it back and forth rather than have two different systems. Mm -hmm. And I also will answer the phone for you when it rings rather than seeing people rush to try to get to the phone, mm -hmm. which is where people fall, hurrying to the door, hurrying to the telephone, not paying attention. Um, so you can actually answer it. And I will get you the information if you don't have it to add to your list because it is so much, it's, it's convenient because you can program it to call your neighbor, and if they don't answer, call 911. It has seven settings for phone calls. So if you call, if, if it calls and you don't pick up and push seven, it hangs up and it calls the next person on the list. Or you can switch it to 911, and when you push the button, it only calls 911. Okay? And there's a simple thing for me that I tell people when I decide if I sell one is, now you need a realtor box, and you've got to lock it up outside, put the key in it to the house, or have the little app thing for a lock because when firemen come, if they can't get in, they will kick your door down, okay? And so I don't just sell the product. I tell them what else they need to do yeah. to make sure that the product works well, like call your fire department or the rescue response people. Give them the code to the lockbox. Make sure that the lockbox is accessible for them, okay, so that when you fall, they can get into a home. So, and a lot of, a lot of times people don't think about that. Oh, I've got the system. 
Great. They push the button, then I'm going out putting a new front door in the house. You know, you could also install one of the keypad door yeah. locks, and you can create different keypads. So, you know, the keypad for any emergency could be 911. So they get there, they type in 911, and they're in through the door. I mean, there's lots of possibilities of what to do. Or you could, you know, you called 911, you can tell it to unlock remotely, and so it'll unlock, and so they don't have to kick your door down. Exactly. There are a lot of options out there. That's and, where technology really comes in. Um, and you would need someone like them to install it, if, unless you're handy yourself. But I wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> install a new door lock. Ironic that you say that because I, I have them on my house now and I don't carry a house key anymore. I literally don't. I keep my key fab from my truck and my office keys, but I just go home and hit the butt, the code and walk right in now and I find it so much more convenient. And then at work what we did is we used the lock that works on the app. And so I can tell who's coming in and out of the office and when they're coming in and out. And we did that to see how well it worked for our customers, because I have a lot of customers who have dementia. And I find them 10 blocks from home in the middle of winter, in their jammies, okay? And so I would go into the home, and if people say, we want to lock all the doors, we want to make sure you're strapped down in the bed, I said, bad idea. Don't do that. Just make sure you know where they are, you know, um, and make sure when they leave a room, you know they left a room. So, and that's where the, the, the products with the technologies coming in really helping me a lot because I would have to fight with people that wanted to put a baby gate up to stop them from going down their stairs. Well, they'll climb right over it or they'll knock it down. You know, if you don't have a door to actually lock to go to the basement, you want to know when they're heading to the basement so, um, so you can stop them. What if you're outside your home and trip and fall? Well, if you trip and fall outside your home, then within a certain distance, the thing will work. But if you're like too far away for the monitor to work, you're probably going to be too far away for it to work to call a 911, you know, to call a service to call unless it's working off a satellite, um, which they I probably do. having a cell phone. Yeah. Well, a cell phone really helps, and if you are falling outside or falling a lot, a walker helps even better. <laughs> so, I mean, this is the problem is people don't want to use a walker because they don't want to look like they're old, but then they keep falling and hurting themselves and can't get up. Well, if you fall and can't get up, you need a walker or a cane, sometimes to keep your balance. Um, when you lose your balance and fall forward, you can't move as fast to catch your balance when you're, when you're 80 or 90. You just go and hit the ground. Or put your arms up and break your arms or your leg, or, you know, so, and it's much more difficult to heal. So the uh, first thing I tell people when I see them and they got their hands and everything, walker. Well, I want wood railing throughout the whole house. Well, I can't put it at the doorways. Use a walker. I'll put railing on the stairs. I'll put iron railing on your outside steps, but use the walker once you get to the flats, okay? Um, and that's where most people hurt themselves. They're in denial, and they won't use a walker, and they fall. And then they go to rehab, and then they come home with a walker, and then I would go in and set the whole house up for them. And uh, I'd prefer not to – I mean, I, I make money at it, but if you could just use a walker and not fall, it would be fantastic. There's enough people I have to do work for that if people just used a walker, they wouldn't fall. You know, so I do a lot of arguing when I go into a house. If you yeah, see that. A lot of arguing. <laughs> but right? it's always for, for a good reason. It's, yeah, I'm always arguing to make them safe, even when they're denying that they don't need it. You know, I'll sit and argue with them for 15 minutes. You know, and then I'll say, I'll put it in. If it doesn't help, I'll take it out. Because I never take it out. It always works. Simple thing like hand railing. Well, I can't get furniture up and down the stairs anymore. What? Once a year you take something up and down your stairs, but you go up three times a day. You need railing. You know, if you can't make it to the top, you need a stair lift, you know. So, and it all starts at a point with a cane, a walker, a wheelchair, if you live long enough. And now everyone's living to be 100 almost. We wonder why dementia is such an issue. Well, they might be able to keep you living longer, but your brain wears out. Your eyes wear out. Everything wears out. Just like a house or a car. And it happens with this, too. If you live long enough, you'll start forgetting things. When you're 100, you have a hard time remembering things. So that's why dementia is starting to increase with people because they're living so much longer. And so then our memories go, and you start having dementia. So, and, it's, it, and now the baby boomers are there, so you guys are, everyone's going to be much busier. Uh, and with the technology that's out there, we're able to keep them in the home longer, which is it's good for the family. It's good for the person to, to be in their home. And I'll say, do you want to stay in your home till you drop dead? And they say yes. 
You know, I mean, they we're all going to die. People have a hard time talking about it. Well, 17 years, it's gotten easy for me to talk about it. I'll have a customer with ALS, and they want me to put a $60,000 bathroom in, and they're only going to live a year. And I know they're only going to live a year. So I say, you're going to die in a year. Why do you want a $60,000 bathroom? Or less than a year, you know? When they see me, they have six months to a year left before they're going to die. And i got to tell them, you're wasting your money. No. And so I do things my way, and it works. And when he dies or she dies, the spouse calls me, and I take it all out. And then they're not having to remember it. It'll all be in there for him. It's all gone. So... I always think about the person before I think about money. And that's how I've become successful. It's not about money for me. It's all about helping somebody stay in their home and convincing them what they need to do to stay in their home. And that's hard. Probably the hardest part about what I do is just convincing people they're getting older and these things are needed. I have epilepsy, and I break bones all the time. I just had my neck fused, and I go Monday to have my back fused. I've broken my neck, my back, my skull. I've bled into my brain. I've broken 21 bones. I know what it's like not to be able to get up. I know what it's like not to be able to move, but use the bathroom, have broken hands, a collarbone, not wipe myself. So I know what everybody needs because I've already gone through it all, and I'm only 50. I started having seizures when I was 21. I all I have are grandma seizures. So I always break something when I have a seizure. Or, you know, so that's where I got my experience. So when somebody says, well, you don't know, I'll be like, you want to bet? I know. I know. I had my neck fused and my back done, and now I'm going back three months later to have my lower back fused again. So it is something we all go through, some younger than others. You know, some have mobility a lot longer than others. I find that people with mobility get dementia. But people without mobility, totally, totally alert. It's kind of strange. Mm -hmm. And the worst ones are the ones that have mobility and dementia. Because you can't, mm -hmm. it's hard to, you know, that's the problem. You can't keep them in one place. They can zip around the house, no problem. If they're in a wheelchair with dementia, well, it's not a problem. They can't get anywhere, right? So it, it's, it can be difficult figuring out what to do with each individual person. They're not all the same. Everyone is different. So you can't treat them all the same. And that's what contractors and a lot of people, social workers, I hate to say it, and therapists do. They think everybody needs the exact same product, and they don't. Everybody is different. Yes? Has anybody um, brought up funding yet? Um, the question asks is, has anybody brought up funding? Um, Waiver funding in particular? With my, not necessarily with me, because I've only focused mostly on uh, hospitals and therapists that go into the homes. And so I haven't had to deal with a lot of funding. Um, I know there is funding out there through Medicaid. Medicare is very limited on what they provide. Um, Long-term insurances do fairly well, but nobody ever has them. Um, and then there are funds like in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C., if you're a low income, they have funds that will provide you up to $6,000 to age you in your home. One good thing about that is, is that if you're not aging in your home and you fall and go to a nursing home, the minute all your money is gone, then Medicaid and the state are picking up the cost. And that's 10000 a month. So you give somebody $6,000 to adapt their home and they don't fall and go to a nursing home, you just save $10,000 each month. So financially, it's a benefit for both the city and the customer. They don't lose their home. And it's a benefit because they get their mobility, you know. Um, it was a win-win for everybody in that situation. And the program has done so well downtown. It started at, uh, what, $3 million. They went to $5 million. Now they want $8 million. They got three other nonprofits starting up. Um, it really works. Georgetown did a study on, our, on this program. It had a 95% approval rating, and it had a 70% fall reduction, which is unbelievable to get that out of, you know. And that was just from putting risers on toilets, grab bars and showers, stair lifts or wood railing on stairs, iron railing outside, basically. And, and that kept people from falling. For Medicaid funding, for assistive technology, and for home modifications, there are two different categories in funding. So you can get, um, even though generally it's, it's all under the assistive tech um, umbrella, home modifications are a separate pool of funding under certain Medicaid waivers. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics of that because, again, that's a topic that could be a whole other webinar. Um, but 
that's one category, and then assistive technology can be another category, is, is another category. I can just speak to it really quickly as well. So on the Medicaid uh, portion in Virginia, there is a $5,000 maximum annually. By the way, that can repeat for as long each year, as long as there's a justification for it. Um, so it's through um, United Healthcare, Virginia Premier, Aetna, um, Magellan, Anthem. Optima, and Anthem. Those are, the, those are the six plans on the Commonwealth Coordinated Care Program, or Care Plus Program in Virginia. They, so, so it's 5K a year, right? You also have the option to um, use what they call a lifetime benefit one time, which is 10 grand. So if, if you were to, if you had a requirement that cost 10 grand, you you could use that, but then you wouldn't get you wouldn't get any more funding for for the, the duration, right? So that's that's the program that we work within, and of course we do private pay as well. And as Greg mentioned, is long term care, which you know they just a note on long term care. Best time to actually have a plan is right around 50. If you don't if you don't have one, and you plan to get one, don't wait. Um, just the, the cost, the ROI uh, metrics in it uh, dictates the best time to plan is between 50 and 55. Um, in Virginia, depending on where you are, it's indexed by location. Um, and I, you may have mentioned, someone may have mentioned this, but let's say in, in Arlington, for example, um, I think that on some of the plans, the benefit may be $80,000 a year. And you can use that for a wide variety um, home modifications included, but other types of uh, in-home care. Um, if you're in Southern Virginia, it may be $60,000 a year, right? But long-term care through you know, private insurance is another way to fund these types of modifications. Also, if you're a veteran, we are a, um, a licensed uh, veteran, they call it veteran ID builders. So we're actually licensed and, and accredited through the VA to do modifications for veterans. If you, if you are a veteran, the benefit is up to $80,000 a year. Um, so those are some of the ways, some, those are some of the funding sources that, that we've worked within, VA, private insurance, private pay, and Medicaid. And, and I would say that, you, you know, I do all the modifications and evaluations, but when it comes to billing, and that would leave it to Kelly to figure out how it could be Funded or the ARC. I mean, they have a lot of information on, on funding. Uh, so, if we work as a group and somebody doesn't have the funding, maybe the ARC can help um, with with that funding. Uh, MS Society used to have a fund that people with MS could pull from. It was five hundred dollars, not a lot, but it was five hundred a year, and they had a loan closet. Um, and but I don't know if that is the same with other disabilities, you know, physical or mental disabilities if they have those options, but the best thing would be to go, if you have Down syndrome, is find a network of Down syndrome, you know, online and see how other people have had products paid for, whether the city or state can help, you know, uh, on low income. Here's something that I didn't hear mentioned about technology, but this is a very simple thing. Seniors and people with disabilities can't take the trash out. The only way it can be done in, in Maryland and in Virginia is if you call the waste management company, they give you a different colored trash can. And it means the trash men take it to the house, to the curb, and back. So you don't have somebody trying to drag it to the curb. I've had a lot of customers fall just trying to take a trash can down to the curb. And when you get to a certain age, it gets hard. So you can call, you know, the Montgomery County is uh, waste management. And they come and they give you a yellow recycling bin. When they see the yellow bin, they know that they have to pick the trash up at the house and put it back at the house so that people, and it's for seniors. It's a, it's, and I'm pretty sure I've heard of it in Virginia too, but every waste management, every trash service is different. And so, but it is something to check if you have seniors having a hard time with trash. It's a real simple thing. I don't even make money on it, but I don't want them to see them fall. I hate to put 5000 or $4,000 or $3,000 of the product in their house and they fall taking the trash out. And so I try to give them any information I can that's going to help that lives in their home, the, the trash, taking trash out. And like she said, all these services delivering food, and, and, and it's so much easier now to stay in your home. The only problem is seniors don't like computers. I don't like computers. Very rarely do I even e read emails. So if you have a child, if they have a, a kid who can help with the assisted with all the electronics, it's going to be a benefit to try to teach a 90-year-old how to use an app 
It's impossible. But it's easily impossible. now, you can have someone set it up for you, and then you can That's just right. say, Alexa, order exactly. this. Exactly. Right. I do it. And you don't even have to touch it. I thing. say, hey, Google, put this on my shopping list. And she just does it. And then I look on my phone, and it's there. Okay. You know, it's my battery dies on my phone. Yes. Oh. There is a specific diverter valve that you can adjust the temperature so no matter how high you put it, it can't burn. So if that's what you're talking about, so you can get the water adjusted to the right temperature, it has a small little delta makes, it has a small valve you turn, and then when it's the right temperature, you'll turn it on all the way and it'll only let it get to that temperature. So uh, we put them in for people that have issues vision or have problems with remembering, you know, if they have Alzheimer's so they don't burn themselves. It's either that or you turn the water heater down to a point where they can't burn themselves, but then you don't get as long a shower because the hot water won't stay hot as long in the tank. So you're better to just put a different diverter in, but that's expensive. If you turn the water heater down on the water heater, that's free. Okay? So this is what I will tell them. <coughs> These are the things that we can do. Turn the water heater down lower so they don't burn themselves, or let me put a new diverter in that I can set so that when they turn it on, it won't burn them. And there are, um, like, shower things that you can set, like, what the te exact temperature is, like 80 degrees or, but again, those are relatively expensive. They're marketed as luxury products, so they're not, you know, if you want to do that for your home, you can. And so it's not going to prevent them from, from turning the water on too hot or too cold, but you can set the exact temperature that you want. Yeah. Well, see, that's amazing. They're coming out with new stuff every day. So, um, but it's not, it's not what he's saying where it's, it won't, it'll prevent them from burning themselves. It's just you can set the temperature to what you want it. Mm. So, I mean, if they have dementia or, or Alzheimer's or something, it's, they're probably not going to remember to set it. Now, if it can yeah. be preset all the time and they can't change it, that would be great. Um, um, I haven't looked in to see if it can be preset and then it's just at that temperature all the time, but I know that you can, like it's, you know, it's like if you're checking the temperature in your pool or your hot tub, you can set it, like you say, it's like 103 degrees or, and you can set the degree when you go in. So the water is exactly at the temperature that you want it. Yeah, that being a love item, it probably has to have a new diverter valve installed anyways, the hot and cold valves because the only way an electronic could do it would be to adjust the valve inside. Yeah. So, and that is cool when you're buying a new house, but it's a lot more expensive when you have an old house. So um, that's why I said that that universal design is much better building a new home. Adapting is much better if you have an 80-year-old house that, you know, you're not, don't want to adapt. You don't want to spend a lot of money on. So, I mean, you don't want to spend money on the modifications to make your kitchen completely accessible because that's $50,000, $45,000. It's not cheap at all, you know, so, and a lot of people can't afford it on their retirement incomes, you know, or if somebody with a disability doesn't have that kind of money. So if you can't find it from some place, but you need it, then you have to come up with another alternative. So, and that's what we try to do is find the cheapest way. And if they want the most expensive way, I'll do that too. I've got no problem. I could do anything you want done. I could build you a whole house. And in Northern Virginia, there's a lot of housing vouchers for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities that are available currently in Arlington and, and Fairfax so that you can live in, you know, rental communities out, you know, in Boston or in, and you can uh, ask for reasonable accommodations in those rental units. So that they could, you could hire someone to come in and put those accommodations in for you if they're not already installed. I already do that for uh, places that I'll have housing for seniors or stuff like that. Um, and they'll just call me and say, can you put bars in this bathroom and a handheld? And really, for showering, that's what I would do. I put bars, a handheld, and a clamp to bring your shower down by your side so that when you sit down, it's not spraying in your face. And then people like to sit. If you leave a shower head up there and try to tell them to sit, they're not going to like it because they're going to have the water sprayed in their face the whole time. There's, just, there's no way when you sit down that it won't happen. And so you stick a chair in there and say, you've got to sit there. I'm not sitting. I don't want the water spraying in my face. You put it on a bar right here and it hits you on the chest rather than from above, and everybody's kind of happy, you know. 
and then they're not they're not standing or trying to tub. I hate if they're going to tub on that one page. They got this tub lift is what you got to get them to use. It's called a Belvita tub lift. Right? If they have to tub, that lifts them up and it requires them all the way down for 500 bucks. It's the cheapest way of doing it. Most people can't pull themselves out of a tub. They roll under their knees and push themselves up, and that's how they end up falling. And so I say if you have to tub, use that tub lift because it's, it's, a, it's the least expensive way to do it and the safest. You can actually slide over from the side of the tub onto it so you don't even have to step in. I sell a lot of them. A lot of them. So, so for our webinar folks in here today, I want to say thank you guys so much for joining us. If you have any questions, we're more than happy to stay after and answer them for you. Um, for our folks on our webinar, we're going to wrap it up. Um, please feel free to submit any questions that you may have via email. We are here to answer them and connect you to what you need and the resources that you need. Um, but thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Fantastic. Do you have the information for the emergency alert? Oh, so I'll get that for you. Um. I'll ask you a quick question about Alexa. I have an Alexa. Yes. The only thing I do with it is tell us.